When I was at Plantronics a couple weeks ago, the CTO told me that the age of context that we're heading into, which uses sensors, wearable computers, big data, and all sorts of other things to build new kinds of personalized systems, is the biggest change for consumers since the web. Well, I thought, hmm, it'd be fun to go and talk to one of the key guys who brought the web to us and see if he agrees. And that's why we are talking to Mark Andreessen, the guy who started Netscape, and is one of the most important people in Silicon Valley. And we are going to have a fascinating conversation about robotics and biochemistry and context. Who are you? Uh, I'm Mark Andreessen. Uh, most recently, I'm the co-founder of a venture capital firm called Andreessen Horowitz. Uh, before that, I was a three-time entrepreneur. Um, the company I'm probably best known for is uh, Netscape, yep. uh, which was founded almost 20 years ago. I'm here to because I'm writing a book uh, <laughs> called The Age of Context. I started noticing a pattern we've talked about before um, where the number of sensors on us, around us, and in our world is going up exponentially. Wearable computing is going up exponentially. I mean, Apple's rumored to come out with a watch and Pebble. <laughs> You have a Pebble watch, I know, and Google Glass, and on and uh, Oakley ski goggles, on and on, right? You put these five things together, and I'm seeing that the world is starting to shift. Yeah. And do you, are you seeing the same shifts? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So I started thinking about this a, a while back. The, one of the most influential books I ever read was a book written by David Glurter, who's a computer science professor from Yale, very well-known guy in the, in the field. He wrote a book 20 years ago called Mirror Worlds. And he kind of actually, he kind of called the whole thing. Now, he didn't know all the, you know, you never know all the details of exactly yeah. all the stuff that's going to happen. But what he basically said was computers are going to get so pervasive and networks are going to get so pervasive that we're basically going to be able to build a virtual overlay on top of the real world. And we're basically going to be able to get all the information that exists in the real world up into this kind of virtual overlay, like in, into a, in this essentially a, a permanently running simulation, right, in software that runs above the real world. Yeah. And we'll be able to keep the simulation in sync with the real world Right? And so you'll be, if you want to know anything about the real world, you'll be able to know it because it'll exist at the, at the virtual level. Um, and then that will let us do all the things you're talking about. And then it will let us also basically run scenarios on what the real world might be like, right? Because you, you don't just have to have, the virtual world doesn't just need to be a representation of the physical world. It can be that, but it can also be projections of what the physical world might be like in, in many other ways. Um, and I think that's actually happening. I think that's exactly right. And I think it sort of, you know, history is going to arc towards basically having software be in everything, having software know everything, having everything in databases. The implications of this are going to play out for decades. Yeah. Right? Privacy, how marketplaces work, how economics work, you know, on and on and on. The CTO of Plantronics says this is the biggest shift for consumers since the web. And since you were key in build, building the web and bringing that to us, do you agree with that? I think it's a pretty big deal. I mean, I think it's one of those things, I don't know, there will be signature moments, like Google Glasses might be a signature moment, right, or the Apple Watch or the Pebble Watch or something. There will be these kind of moments that crystallize it. But this strikes me as one of those things, this strikes me as a very long-term, multi-decade trend, right, of, of, of with like a very large number of implications. And it'll basically be a process of trying to work our way through what all the implications are. So right. it, as opposed to anything that happens like in any one particular month or year. Yeah, some of the things I'm seeing, so let's just talk about consumers, then we'll talk about companies and that. Cause it, I know you, you and I both share an interest in both large company and small company, right. which is not, not often found, I guess. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but on the consumer side, this is already bringing us new, th new things. Uh, first of all, it's bringing highly personalized products. So when I talk to General Motors or Ford, they're expecting you to sit in the car, and it's going to know that you're sitting, uh, that you're driving the car, not sitting in the car, right? And because there's going to be 3D sensors on on you, and it's going to face detect on you, and your phone that you're carrying into the f or devices that you carry into the car are going to identify and talk with the car, and it'll do things like uh, tell the car where your next meeting is without you having to key something in, like I have to on my Toyota right now, right? right. So a highly personalized product is one, and then. Um, Highly predictive product, or like Google Now is a great uh, example. It's trying to get ahead of what, where we're going and try to predict what we're going to need next, where our next meeting is, where our next plane fare is, or, or uh, where our next meal will be. And it, it's trying to get ahead of us and assist us in living our life, be assistive, I guess. Mm -hmm. Are you <laughs> seeing companies or oh, yeah, things yeah, that sure. are coming along that yes. exciting you <laughs> on those two things? Two basically, yeah, every, well, we're, we're basically, we're, we feel like we're drinking from a fire hose every day. We're seeing like every conceivable new idea we could possibly imagine. But um, 
I think that's all true. I also think that there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole series of economic changes. So let's take cars as an example, right? So like, here's a whole bunch of things that don't make sense. Like it doesn't make sense. Like if I go buy a car, like if I, suppose I go lease a car. Like if I go lease a car and it's a new car, the guy, the guy who's leasing me the car doesn't know anything about who I am as a driver. Like he actually knows very, very little. And so it's very hard for him. Everybody kind of gets the same lease terms based on what the actual value of the car is going to be when they return it. But of course, who I am and how I drive it, right, down to the individual level, down to the mile by mile level, is like incredibly important, yeah. right? And so having the car be able to actually understand how it's being driven, right, and having the car be able to understand who's driving it, and am I loaning it out to my teenage daughter, and, 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 right, is gonna then back up all the way back into how I get charged for the lease. Conversely, if I'm buying a used car, I have no idea how that car's been driven. Yeah. Has it been in an accident? You know, did it get fixed? Like, you know, have there been problems? Like, what, what you know, how well was it treated? I don't have any idea. And so all the same consumer face, direct consumer facing functionality you're talking about will translate back into being able to more effectively price uh, used cars. And we're seeing this at Tesla, right? Took on the New York right. Times because they knew the behavior of the journalist right. who was driving the car and knew where he was driving and, and how fast he was going and right. how, how long he recharged the car and all, all sorts of fun stuff that, right. that I'm sure many people haven't thought that the car is studying about them. Right? Exactly, and this is very interesting. It's one of the things that I think it was, I uh, forget who it was who said it, or the public editor of the New York Times said, you know, Tesla has like all the data of exactly what happened and it turns out the reporter actually had a little red notebook that he was like jotting down notes in. There's a big difference, right, between those. Yeah. The reporter could have instrumented the entire drive, right? Had the reporter known what was had thought thought ahead about this, he would have had an app running on his iPhone that would have actually tracked the entire drive, and so he would have had an equal amount of data, or at least a lot of it, right? But he didn't think ahead of that. We our, our running joke around here has been how do we get every single product any of our companies built instrumented to that degree before they go out to reviewers, right? For exactly this reason, like this is like a revolution in how you can like fact check people who do product reviews. I, I right. on our drive down to Vegas for the Consumer Electronics Show, we turned on Glimpse and shared that with uh, everybody on Twitter and Facebook. And somebody clocked me doing 100 miles an hour. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And I was like, oh, wait a second. I'm going to get mailed a ticket if I keep this up. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so I think there's all kinds of implications. As you think about the data that can be collected for the consumer, the whole experience of being a consumer, I think, gets reworked around a lot of these markets, right? So another, you know, another one of my favorite examples on, on sort of the impact of the sort of physical world being mapped in the virtual world is sort of you know, the, the whole idea of how Airbnb operates. Right, right up to and including the idea that Airbnb interconnects with the social data, right? So that if, if you know, we don't know each other, but I'm traveling to New York and you have your house available for rent, but we have a mutual Facebook friend, like Rocky, right? That it'll, it'll prioritize your place above anybody else's and it'll list the fact that we have a mutual friend that we didn't know about and be able to establish trust. Yeah. So all of a sudden you have this, one of the big themes we're kind of playing with right now is sort of this idea that all markets are going to liquefy to a much greater extent than it's ever been the case in the past. Like all supply of everything is gonna unlock in a new way. When you say all markets are gonna liquefy uh, Well, the market, for, like, for, the market for rental real estate is a perfect example. Right? It, it's sort of like what eBay was able to do for collectibles applied to basically everything, right? So this is sort of like ride sharing services, right? You know, like uh, Uber and Sidecar and all these things are, are liquefying the available supply of cars, right? On the fly, right? On a drive by drive basis in a way that's just never been practical before. Uh, Airbnb is liquefying real estate, right? I can stay in somebody's house overnight. Like, yep. Staying at somebody's house overnight, who I've never met before, has never been a thing that can ever be done efficiently. It can only be done ever at like extremely small scales, like villa rentals and vacation stuff like that. But there's never been a broad-based way to do that. And then, by the way, the data goes straight into it. Like, who is the person who's going to stay at my house? How much do I know about them? Who is the person whose house I'm about to stay in? What am I actually doing in the house while I'm staying there? You know, am I on you know three <laughs> D cameras? You know, tracking everything. You know, um, all the all the lock. Here's another thing: all the locks are going to be hooked up, right? So all yep. the locks are going to go online. Cause Lockatron know, is Lockatron, one company, right. and there I'm sure there's others that you can use your iPhone to unlock your door, right? Yeah, and and then back to cars. Cars like telematics and cars. Like one of the reasons telematics and cars are going to become important. So like remote remote unlocking. So like one of the ideas around cars, if you take these ride sharing services to their natural conclusion, right? The way that it, the way that driving a car will work in the future is I'm walking down the street and I realize I need to take a car to the you know for the next two miles. And I like click on my phone and like boom, like the four cars that are sitting here parked in this block that are available for rental, right? Sort of light up and bid themselves at me and basically say, okay, I'm available for this. If you get me back here by four o'clock, then it'll be at this discounted rate, right? Or people driving around who might want to take me someplace. Or cars that are driving around. Or cars, <laughs> or like ultimately cars. So my favorite new idea that I would love to figure out a way to fund a company, there, is, there, there are some people trying to do this. Um, uh, peer-to-peer uh, drone-based physical delivery networks, right? So think about this one. So think okay. about a think about a decentralized network uh, of landing pads for drones, yep. and then think about a decentralized network of drones, 
whose function is, and the drone's function is to carry packages, right? And so these would be drones that literally, like, they, they land on the landing pad, and you, like, walk up to them, and you put a package in, and the drone flies off and, and delivers the package to the, near, to the nearest landing pad, to the recipient. You know, I send you a, a present or whatever over this thing. Um, the key being it's an actual peer-to-peer -peer network. I, I, the, no company goes out and funds 10,000 drones. Instead, the drones are all independent contractors, right? So anybody can put a drone into the network, and then the drones bid against each other to be able to get the delivery jobs, right? The next logical, it's like Uber for drones, right? <laughs> right exactly. And so, and so, is the FAA going to allow this? Because well, at some point, one of these is going to take down an airliner. <laughs> hopefully, they'll fly low. Yeah, no. There's all kinds of, and this goes, this goes straight to it. There's all kinds of questions then around. Yeah, right. So, right. When, whenever there's a new thing, you know, Uber's dealing with this right now. Yeah. Uber's going city by city, and cracking the code. Uh, you know, one way or another, they have to work their way through all the different taxi regulations. Um, and so there's there's regulatory you know impact on almost every single one of these issues. By the way, the pattern like for things like Uber seems to be the users love it. Like yeah. all these new things, like the users love it. The, all the entrenched competitors hate it, right? And so there's this massive outrage, um, usually at the city government level, city officials at first side with the incumbents because they're the source of all the tax revenue. Yeah. And so, but then what happens is there's a user revolt, right? And then at some point, the new companies actually are gonna, I think, all end up paying taxes, and then the whole thing is gonna equalize out, yeah. right? Which is then when the incumbents are really in trouble. Um, and so that's sort of part of the process that all these new things have to go through. It's actually gotten very hard to fund any new companies anymore that aren't going to cause some perturbation in kind of the existing model of how laws and regulation work, because obviously they weren't designed to take these kinds of ideas into account. No, it's yeah. a crazy world, yeah. I and mean, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so personalized and predictive product on the consumer side. On the, on the company side, yeah. I, I'm really trying to get my head around what it means for marketers or for yeah. executives who run Procter & Gamble. Yeah. And I'm starting to see, well, one, you're going to uh, know your company in very deep detail. Mm -hmm. And you, you're going to see it on a mobile phone. You're, you're going to know where every package is, every worker, every robot, every, every piece of inventory is right there. Um, and we're close to that right now for most companies. But you're going to know your customer in a very deep detail. That's right. When they walk through your door, in fact, you're going to know they're coming to you yeah. because they've signaled to the world you know, like, hey, I'm going to Sun Valley in, in, in late March. I've already signaled to the world that I'm going to that. I bought a ticket already. I have bought a hotel. I'm going to a conference, the debt conference, right? And so Sun Valley knows I'm coming. Right. And right. what does that mean? Right. You know, how is that going to change? And then when I do come, they know my clout score. They know my Facebook ac account, my likes, my friends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they know my tweets. They know my blogs. They know a lot about me. Right, right. They know whether giving you special service is going to pay off in the form of like increased recommendations because you're an influential node in the network, right? Or they're going to know whether they need to be like be walking on eggshells because you tend to complain a lot, you tend to turn people off. Like they're they're like yeah, it's all going to be it's all going to surface up to them. So this is a big deal for a lot of reasons. One is it's really striking how many businesses in the world today have functioned for in some cases hundreds of years and still today where they really don't know who their customers are. Right, and so we, we, we think about this a lot. It's one of the reasons we've been investing in certain areas in gaming as an example, which is like even video game companies that have been selling video, you know, modern kind of software companies. So in video games, right, the whole history of the video games industry, the data they have on their customers is based on their sell-in reports into the retail channels like Walmart. Yeah. They don't actually know who the customer is on the other side. They don't have a relationship with them. Your typical band, your typical band, music, your typical musical act, or your typical movie star has no idea who their fans are. Like, they simply don't know. Like, some of them have fan clubs and they're able to figure this out, but like, in a lot of cases, like, you know, does even like George Clooney have any idea who his fans are? No idea. Yep. He only knows very gross aggregate numbers. And, and so as you go across basically the entire economy, most big businesses, consumer packaged goods companies, all these guys, media companies for that matter, like in most cases don't actually know who their customers are. Um, and in the new world, they can. Now, yep. whether they, you know, sort of this is sort of the disruption thing is I think there's a bunch of industries where this is a disruptive enough change that the ability for the new entrants in a lot of these markets who are going to enter with sort of state-of-the-art database technology, state-of-the-art social integration, right, is going to be, like, for example, retail, yep. right? The average retail store, like, if, 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 like, you're the owner of the store and you're in there every day, you might know who some of the people are when they come in just because you recognize them. But almost no retail store today has a system where when somebody walks in the door, there's an alert that goes up, right, ideally yep. in your per peripheral vision, right, in your Google Glasses, right, which would say, basically, you know, this is Joe. He last came in a year and a half ago, but before that, he was in eight times. Boom, boom, boom. Oh, according to his social network, he just moved back into the area. You know, I want to really take special care of him. Like, and so we're going to, I think we're moving into a world where not having information like that at the point of contact with the customer is going to be viewed as strange. I mean, today, having that information would be viewed as strange. Yeah. Like, how on earth did you know that I like Chardonnay? I've never met you before. 20 years from now, 
it's going to be viewed as bizarre if you don't know who I am when I walk in the door. And I think that's just, you know, it, it's, it's hard to imagine a bigger change than that. And in the... I mean, think about the consequences for dating. Oh, the highlight is, yeah. you know, I was just at Highlights launch this morning, yeah. and when we walk close to each other, I know your likes, I know your friends in common, mm -hmm. now I get to see pictures that you posted, because they, they just have pictures. Yeah. That has a lot of comp... Yep. And then I can use, it's all hooked into Facebook, of course, so now I can use Facebook's new graph search to do all sorts of funny searches, you know. Yep. Show me all single women that have dogs that are 25 to 50 <laughs> that also programs. Uh, Ruby on Rails, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, that's right. Um, this is going to be a freaky area. Yeah. I, I call it a freaky line. I, I'm way over the freaky line because I don't care about this stuff. I, I, I've already gone totally public with my life for most of my life. Right. Most people are over here, though, and they're like, what? Yeah. I'm going to be 3D tracked when I walk into a store, and that's already happening. I, I already did an interview with uh, Prime Sense, which makes the 3D sensor, and they're... they're uh, partner is putting them, the shopper, I forget the name, but they're putting them over uh, displays at Walmart and they are doing it, shopping analytics. They can see somebody pulling a box of Cheerios off the shelf in real time right. and they can show that customer, hey, if you bought three boxes, you get, save 20% or something like that right. uh, and do offers in real time based on your behavior. And it, it's un unbelievable how accurate it is and how, how interesting it is but to yeah. most people it's like what yeah. i'm being tracked that way yeah yeah it freaks people out yeah so how are we going to get over the freaky line so i think it, it basically always happens the same way which is it's the same thing with doing all your searches through google right it's the same thing with like having all of your friends on facebook it's the same thing with you know checking in locations on foursquare which is it's the point at w so i call it <laughs> i call it free ice cream right it's the point at which the free ice cream is simply too tasty right it, like the services all tend to have the, the, the attribute of the kind of thing we're talking about is they all tend to be free to the user, right? They yeah. all tend to be free to the consumer. They get paid for some other way. Um, and like free services to the consumer, like at some point they're just so valuable. Like they're free ice cream. It's like, oh, this guy's offering me free ice cream. I'm gonna take the free ice cream. You know, oh my God, I can keep up with all my friends online. Oh my God, I can find out information about anything. Like these are very powerful user incentives to use these things. Uh, so people are voting with their own clicks uh, yeah. to, to do this. Um, and they're opting in, not because they have some theoretical idea about the pros and cons, but because they're getting real practical value. So like we call this in a lot of these things, we call this sort of the single user use case. Like even the social, like all the social products still need to figure out like what's the appeal, what's the self-interest to the individual user to be able to participate in the system, yeah. right? Completely independent of what the aggregate effect. Right? The, the, these companies care about the aggregate effect, it's the user who cares about their own experience. Yeah. But these are very powerful user experiences, right? And, and, and I think that's, that's the thing. And I think they're so powerful you know, the, the one that's on deck, which is really interesting, right, which huge implications is health, um, right? Because it's been the case, we've lived in a culture our entire lives, some of us more than others from the Midwest, you never talk about anything. Um, but, um, you know, we don't talk, like we don't tend to talk about it, like we, we tend to don't talk about it, like our health is like proprietary data to ourselves. And by the way, like the way insurance is priced, like that is, you know, like if you've got like some sort of medical condition, like you don't necessarily want everybody to know it because that could actually affect your ability to get insurance. Yeah, you know, or get hired. Yeah, or get yeah. hired. And, and, and so there's all these like very, very big practical issues. Um, on the other side of it, there's all this phenomenon. There's this whole phenomenon of health blogging, right? There's this yeah. whole phenomenon of people who have, you know, so, and this is true, you know, blogging and social networking and tweeting and everything else. But, and, you know, so people who are, you know, people who are experiencing the same condition, whether it's diabetes or certain forms of cancer or weight loss or whatever it is, are able to come together online just like they would come together around any other topic. And they're able to share with each other and they're able to form, you know, support groups and they're able to share information. And they're able to be part of a community. And the positive benefits to going through something very difficult, you know, in the old days, you're in your town and you don't know anybody else who has whatever problem you have. Yeah. Now you can actually be communicating with all these other people going through the same thing. Quality of life and the quality of the experience is going to be dramatically better, right? But with the flip, so there's sort of this incentive to actually, like yeah. people are actually going online and volunteering all this information. And then we collectively all just need to figure out how to navigate through that to the other side of this. And the other side of this is a world in which much more of this information is public. Well, and we're right. getting much more data. I, I visit Stanford, and they're now doing really weird research with DNA and RNA, 
And the cost of studying that is going way down. Right. And the cost of building new experiments is going way down. And we're seeing a lot of innovation. Are, are you investing in any companies in that world? Of so we don't do medical. Okay. Um, we, uh, we don't do biotech. So we don't do like drug design. We're just not, this, those are specialist firms that with deep experience in that kind of thing. Um, we do have an internal debate on a regular basis of this intersection of medicine and, and, and information science, right? So computer science. So medical informatics and bio, you know, sort of this bioinformatics field. And so we're, that's one of our sort of, we, we have sort of this zone of, called the circle of competence of what we think we know how to do, and this is like right on the edge. So we haven't yet pulled the trigger in anything, but I, I, I wouldn't be surprised in five years if we've expanded out to do more of that, because it's becoming so computer science centric. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then it feeds back into everything we're talking about, right? Yeah. It's more detailed analytics, like, you know, yeah, exactly. Like, now, so one of my theories, like, uh, like the, the privacy side of this, I actually think is fairly easy to solve believe it or not, which is basically, I think that, <laughs> I actually think it's a process of removing stigmas, right? It's like most people yeah. have things today that are considered secrets. But if everybody really knew how many other people had the exact same secret, it wouldn't be such a big deal anymore, right? right? And the, 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 the classic example of that, I think, is, you know, there was a point where being gay was such a problem in society that it actually was considered a um, condition that would the condition. It was considered a state that would prevent you from being a government employee, and certainly, like in a, like a, for example, like you literally couldn't work for the CIA yeah. because you could get blackmailed. Well, if being gay doesn't have stigma associated with it, then you can't blackmail people on it, right? yeah. and then it's no longer a problem, and then it's just fine, right? And so, I actually think that same phenomenon is going to happen like more and more often. I totally agree. I, my dad had a kidney transplant. I have the same weird kidney disease. They don't know what it is. We talk about it in public, and doctors around the world are like, "Hey, what, what about this?" And you better not eat bananas, <laughs> you know, or, yeah. or you better <laughs> you yeah. have this checked out. Make sure you, you know. And here's the latest science that we have, you know. And it's it's really remarkable compared to 20 years ago that we can connect to each other that way. Right. Um, and the benefits, right? The benefits. Yeah. So number one, that your your benefits, you and your father's benefits of being able to understand what's going on, right? So the like, benefits there. Societal benefits of like understanding that like whatever conditions like mental health is going to be a huge like area for yeah. this in the future like mental health, you know the science basically says mental health is not a personality flaw like it's an actual like these are actual medical conditions, right? But like socially that's not it's still to this day not broadly accepted. But like that's going to become much better understood and that's yeah. going to have all kinds of huge social social benefits, and then the ability for example for medical researchers to be able to really understand like okay I need to go you know from st studying a certain thing let's go get like a dozen people who have this problem without it taking a year and a half. Like being able to do that, right? Let's go to yeah. let's go to uh, brain research. Yeah. You know, when I spoke at the Next Web a year ago, I was wearing a uh, galvanic skin respond uh, response uh, sensor, mm -hmm. and the guy who invented it was watching my behavior in real time on his iPhone, right. <laughs> so he could tell I was a little nervous when I started the speed chat. And then he came on stage and we had a little chat, and we started talking about the red light district in Amsterdam because it was the speech was in Amsterdam. And it, my my uh, response jumped up. He's like, "Hey, my, my stress level just went up, and I'm just listening." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so <laughs> we're going to be able to study the brain in whole new ways because we're seeing these new tattoos coming along that have l little sensors that watch your heart and watch brain response and all sorts of fun stuffs coming, yeah. isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, how how soon do you know it's ready to invest in? Because some of this stuff is like, mm, not it's still still R and D lab time. Yeah, it's not quite yet ready to productize and turn into a company. So the challenge for venture capitalists, so venture capitalists often malign. Um, we are the long term money in the market. Like they're really, I like to say, like we, there's us and there's Warren Buffett, and that's it. Like there is no other long term money in the market. When long term being like ten plus years. Um, but the practical reality of it is, just over the history of all of venture capital, the average time from investment to exit of the investment is seven years, right? And so what that kind of tells you, and you know, venture capital is, is dependent on its investors, right? Which are these large endowments and foundations. So like, it's not like we invest in a vacuum, we actually have people we're accountable to in the process. And so kind of the way the math of venture capital works, at least using all the approaches that are known of today, um, is you kind of have to be able to get to market for sure within three to five years. Because um, if you can't, it's just going to simply take too long and you're not going to be able to, you know, you're not going to be able to find enough new investors to keep the company going that long. And no individual venture capitalist can fund a company out over 15 or 20 years. It's just there aren't investors that will fund that today for the most part. Um, and so you kind of need something that's going to get to market within three to five years and more frequently it's sort of two to three years. What that basically says, 
I think, um, is that you then have to look back before that and you have to say, okay, well, how long has the research been in development? Probably in university research labs, right? Maybe in corporate research labs, probably in university research labs. Yeah. Or, or looked at conversely, I like to say that virtually everything we're going to invest in 10 years from now is already running. It already exists. It's, it's running in a university research lab. It's over at Stanford or MIT or one of these places. And there are grad students using it. And they think it's obvious and they don't understand why the rest of the world hasn't figured it out yet. Yeah. And at some point, they're going to graduate or drop out and then hopefully they come raise money and then they turn it into a product. But, you know, like the internet, right? The, the consumer internet became a thing in like 1994, but yeah. the development on the internet started in like 50s, early 60s, right? Yeah. So kind of 30 years of federally funded R&D. And so you tend to see these kinds of things. And then conversely, venture capitalists seem to get in the most trouble when they try to fund things kind of ahead of the research maturing. So a lot of the clean tech, a lot of what's been happening in clean tech lately, like one way of looking at it is that there was not a 30 year run of clean, federally funded clean tech research in universities before the VCs decided to fund clean tech companies. Interesting. Right, like that, that you know, that may, they, they, people may argue with that, that may or may not be true, but if you look at, it, the reason I say this, if you, look at, if you look at the history of information technology, that was the case, and that was successful for venture capitalists, and if you look at biotech, that was the case. And really for all of venture capital, information technology and biotech are really the only two fields that have really worked. And those are the two that have had the 30-year track record. They've had the National Science Foundation and DARPA for computer science, and then they have the National Institute of Health, right, for, for, for biotech. Is that really the advantage of Sand Hill Road being so close to, I mean, you're literally 100 yards from SLAC, the Stanford Linear Accelerator, yeah. where they're doing really mind-blowing research. I don't know if you've been over there lately. Yeah, they are. Uh, they're doing x-ray research and watching electrons move around materials and doing all sorts of fun stuff that will lead to better processors, better memory, and you know, smaller things, which will be a lot of fun. But is it is it is that really Silicon Valley's advantage that we're so close to Stanford and we get you guys like you get to go over there and see what the researchers are working on and what might be out in ten years? It helps a lot. It helps a lot. It's it's a huge advantage. I'll put it this way: I don't think it's possible to have a venture capital uh, ecosystem, a startup ecosystem that's not around a major research university. There's just too much of a feedback loop between the two. The the Stanford feedback loop seems to work the best. But there are others, you know, Boston, for, you know, MIT played this role for, in Harvard to a certain extent for many years. Um, so, like, the number one predictor of where you might have startups is obviously is where there are research universities. Um, I think Silicon Valley has that, but it's not just that because it's not just Stanford, right? It's also, you know, 20 other state-of-the-art research universities. I mean, we back entrepreneurs coming out of every place, Toronto, Washington, Texas, you know, Harvard. Yep. Um, you know, you name it. Places that would never ever have admitted us, right, when we were when we were kids. But no. we'll, we'll <laughs> that was the San Jose State grad. Right. So we'll, we'll back back that. I didn't even graduate. Illinois, exactly. <laughs> Illinois State School. So, we'll, but we'll back the we'll back the Ivy League spinoffs. Um, they, they will let us do that. So, um, so Silicon Valley is that is that, but it's more than that because it's it's the I like to think of it as kind of the gravity well for the talent, including the talent coming out of all these universities that are other places and then coming here because it's the best place to build a company. So on my latest trip through Stanford, I saw a lot of robotics, uh, a lot of things that are affecting robotics. So for instance, there's some kids who are playing with materials that will heal itself after it's cut, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty cool stuff. It's very R&D, um, but in 10 years, that could be a skin on a robotic hand or something that we you know, we use to sense and touch and, and put in dangerous places. And Have you seen soft robots? Uh, no, I haven't. Here's something for you to check out. Okay. Look this up. There's a new field of robotics called soft robotics. And it basically says, what if robots were built essentially out of balloons? Right? So, so basically, is, you actually take a step back. What if the whole field of mechanical engineering was built around soft materials, not hard materials? Okay. Right? And so, for example, uh, it's just, there's all kinds of uh, unbelievable examples. It, uh, and I'll explain why this is relevant in a second. But imagine like an exoskeleton that like sort of um, that helps people walk, you know, people who can't walk helps them walk. Uh, yeah. Or elderly people who don't have enough strength in their legs. You could have like a, like, like you know, one of the ideas, you have a robotic exoskeleton. We saw, there's a video of Ted. Ted had a, a demo of something like that that helped uh, a paraplegic person walk. Exactly. So. So then you got this thing like by default those are going to be hard like they're going to be like machines right and then you fall over and you have a real problem because you're like you're going to get seriously injured because you're going to fall like, on a machine. Um, what if those were like made out of balloons, right? So <laughs> when you're walking you fall over you literally are falling on balloons, right? Or conversely, what if cars like what if what if cars were soft instead of hard, right? right. What if the consequences of a car crash were just like the consequences of a bumper car collision as opposed to like metal, like impacting metal. Well, and, here's and so, where, and it's computers. Yeah. It's the it's the it's the inform it's the uh, it's the it's the revolution in chips and sensors and software that makes it possible to do this. It turns out. And we saw a helmet that already does this. Yeah. It yeah. it senses that it's falling and heading toward Earth, and it pops off a balloon yeah. so that when you hit yeah. your head hits the snow or uh, yeah. you know your skateboard you know fall, it 
you're you're falling into a balloon, right? right? Airbag, yeah. So so right. Airbag. So there's that. But what if the entire helmet itself were soft? What if it never even? What if it just if it just was the balloon? And so there's this, it turns out there's this whole new field of mechanical engineering, um, soft soft materials, and then there's this whole category of robotics, which are soft robotics. Um, so you can imagine everything can match soft drones, right? They could just, you know, they run into an airplane, they just bounce off it, like all kinds of crazy stuff like that. So what else, to finish up, what else are you seeing happen in this contextual world? I, I, I have a theory of Silicon Valley and that I'm watching both big and small companies that if you know something about me, you're, pro, you're gonna do well. Yeah. If you don't know so much about me, you're gonna do worse than your competition. I, this is why I'm switching from Apple to, to Google mm -hmm. because Google knows so much more about me than Apple does. Mm -hmm. And they're gonna soon capture a lot more about me with these glasses and you know, with uh, Google Now and, and interaction on search. And, do you have the same theory? Because you, you watch the same thing. Yeah. A big company, small company. You, you, you are the Mr. Silicon Valley, right? <laughs> we, um, yeah, it's essentially, yes. I mean, like, for example, wearable computing is something we're very hot on. I mean, our main investment there right now is Jawbone, which is doing, like, has an all kinds of stuff coming out for what they're going to do on wearable computing. But there's, you know, a dozen other ideas and really innovative startups around that space. Um, yeah, the big data challenge, I mean, for us, the big data really does come, for, in most applications, it's, it's these giant customer databases and all this real-time information about what people are doing. And so that is a gigantic theme. Um, you know, I mentioned this liquefaction of markets idea. Um, you know, a big one, um, you know, sort of the, 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 the way that users experience that, it, it sort of, <laughs> we like, like the idea of Uber for X, right? So the, the idea of basically your, um, your, your smartphone being a portal into a completely liquefied marketplace and then having the complete information trail for you and then for everybody else in that marketplace um, is like, we think, an incredibly powerful idea across many, many different areas of the economy. You know, uh, as an example, crowdsourcing. Like crowdsourcing to us is an instance of this. So crowdsourcing to us, we, we take crowdsourcing very seriously. Crowdsourcing to us basically is, is not this like cute little thing of like, I'm gonna fund, go fund an independent movie. Like that's not the point. The point of crowdsourcing is what if we had perfect information about supply and demand of everything all the time, right? What if we knew? Like what if yeah. we, when we were gonna set out to make a movie or bring a new product to market or launch a startup, what if we knew who all the customers were ahead of time, right? And what if we knew exactly what they thought? And what, what if we knew exactly what they would be willing to pay? And right, even better than that, what if they were willing to pay in advance to cause something to happen, right, that they, that they wanted to exist? Yep, right? Facebook talks so like this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because they're, they're using the gift store right. to try to predict right. where, what you want next, or, right. you know, and they haven't quite turned on all their ideas, but they're thinking about how do we do this with restaurants, or how do we do this with yeah. other things to get more predictive ahead of the supply chain so that the sushi store owner knows, oh, he better order more sushi because Scoble's coming to town tonight, <laughs> right? Well, even face, like people actually, I think, understate, even just face, if you just think about like something really magical happened on Facebook about five years ago, which is all of a sudden everybody knew everybody else's birthday. Yeah. That's actually never been the case before, especially for those of us who don't tend to like keep track of things. <laughs> yeah. Um, but like all of a sudden everybody knows everybody else's birthday and all of a sudden everybody's notified of everybody else's birthday. And so like that, talk about like a fundamental human experience. Like the number of people who know about your birthday went up by a factor of 10 and then by a factor of 100. Right, and so, and that's just, uh, to me, that's like the tip of the iceberg. Like there's so much more that, you know, that's a vein that can be tapped for, you know, I think for decades. Interesting. What else gets you out of bed in the morning? It's, you're a guy who has lots of choices in the world. You know, you, you could rent a jet and go to New Zealand this weekend, right? Yeah. What, what gets you going? I don't really leave the house. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of things. Probably the biggest one is you never know. The great thing, the, the great thing about about this about this business, you never know when the next really breakthrough idea is going to just walk in the door. Like you yeah. never really know. And by the way, it's very hard to tell, right? I'm not I'm not claiming that like we have any sort of secret formula for figuring that out. But the history of the big breakthrough idea, at least the big breakthrough companies that get built, the history is they do tend to raise venture capital at some point. The history is they do tend to walk in the door at some point. They do, by the way, tend to get told no an awful lot, right? Yeah. Right. The history of most of the big breakthrough companies is they got told no by virtually every possible investor, right, until somebody finally said yes. Um, and so you literally never know. It's actually, it's hard to miss a day of work because you never know if that's the day when the next Mark Zuckerberg or the next Bill Gates is going to walk in the door. And just, and just and by the way, think of how badly you're going to kick yourself, right? If you if you you know if you if you were if you were sleeping that day, right? So you know that's it happens for me. That's motivating. It happens. Yeah, um, it's also why I tell investors start with the start with the people you don't want to 
have fun to you because yeah. they'll probably say no and you'll get better at yeah, hearing yeah, the yeah, no. The and then when you get into, yeah. into your office, yeah. you're a free practice to yeah. do in the pitch and hearing no. Yeah. The trial yeah. run. We would prefer they not do that because we still want to see them first, but <laughs> there is a lot of value. There is a lot of value to what you're saying. How do, how do people get into your office? So venture capital is funny that way, and this is something where there, it's, it's operated the same way its entire life, and there's an open question as to whether it will operate the same way in the future, which is right along the lines of everything we're talking about. So the way it's always worked is it's been entirely a referral business, and so it's always through an introduction of somebody we already know. Yeah. Um, I, we, we knew this was the case. When we started the firm, we stress tested the idea. We went to our friends, actually, uh, uh, I don't think they'd mind this, we went to our friends at Greylock, uh, which is, and Greylock is, uh, in many ways, is, is one of the oldest and most respected venture capital firms. They've operated for, I think, now 45 years, and they've just had a spectacular track record. And we talked to the guys who've been there for a long time, and we said, we asked them the question, we said, how many deals have you funded that came in over the transom, right, somebody just mailing something in, as opposed to through a referral? And they said, 45 years of venture capital, one company. Right. It's a, in every other case, it was through the referral network, um, yeah. and and so for us, it's angel investors, it's you know, it's it's other entrepreneurs, it's you know, it's all kinds of people, but it's it's somebody we know. The question, of course, is is that just an artifact of living in a world where you have incomplete information, right? And what if you knew, right? What if you had other signals, right? And what if, what if you had like much more comp comprehensive information on who all these entrepreneurs were and what they had been through and what they had done, right? And what if you had pre predictive algorithms that you could deploy against it, that information? Or what if you had other signals that you could surface? Uh, I, and so it'll, it's, an inter, it's, it's sort I, of a big question, is our business a people business or an information business? Well, I, I asked right? Steve Greenberg the same thing, and he ha had the same exact answer. He's, he, he, he found the Jonas Brothers and all sorts of music acts. He said, I never find somebody just walk in, in a bar and by accident, you know, right. or I always, it's always a friend who calls me and says, you got to hear this band or hear this performer. Right, right. And but, there's but that's something the thing about is, that. Yeah, there's something, there's some, like that works. There, that works. How, it's possible we're going to be sitting here in 20 years, though, and saying that was stupid because that was artificially constraining the pool. And if we had known who all the bands were, like suppose, yeah. suppose every bar in the country had a sensor system where they could measure the enthusiasm of an audience to a given band, right? And suppose you could get a report as a music scout that basically said, you know, yesterday of the 8,000 bands that played concerts, right, the number one in terms of the emotional response from the audience, right, measured through galvanic skin response, right? Yeah. Suppose it was just simply off the charts. You know, would you get on a plane and would you immediately go out there to find out who it is? Yeah, you probably would. Is it somebody who you would be hearing about from a friend? Yeah, I would say jury's out. Interesting. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to watch how you continue to change the venture business in Silicon Valley. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Robert.